we will begin. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grace Spulak, and I am the director of the New Mexico Commission on Access to Justice. The Access to Justice Commission was formed by the New Mexico Supreme Court in 2004 with the aim of improving access to the courts for people with civil legal needs. So problems basically that aren't criminal, things like housing, um, access to benefits, protection from domestic violence, situations where people have really critical needs that impact their ability to move forward with their lives. And so one of the things that the commission has really taken on as an initiative is making sure that people in our communities have information about legal services that are available to people. And so with that end, we have started this series of webinars so that we can introduce you to some of the wonderful people who are doing work in our communities trying to help people who have various legal needs. And so for this webinar, we're focusing on immigration resources that are available throughout the state. And we have um, an amazing panel of presenters, and I want to thank them all so much for agreeing to do this and share their information and knowledge. I also want to thank Juana Beta, who was really instrumental in helping us pull all of this together. And so with all of that said, I am going to go ahead and introduce our panelists today, and then I will turn it over to them. And so um, from the ACLU, we have Zoila Alvarez Hernandez and Maria Coronado. And Zoila is a Corinne Wolf Transformative Advocacy Fellow who is dedicated to combating the entanglement of local, state, city, and county resources going to increased immigration enforcement and the effect of those, um, that enforcement on children and families in New Mexico. At UNM School of Law, she worked as a senior research fellow at the Center for Education Policy Research. She helped um, co-found the Immigration Law Student Association and served as a Marshall Brennan Project Fellow. In 2018, Zoila also worked as a student attorney at the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Law Clinic in Boston, where she represented South American and Caribbean asylees. Maria Coronado is an immigrant, field, immigrant rights field organizer for the ACLU of New Mexico. She has worked at the ACLU since December of 2018, where she leads Know Your Rights presentations with migrant communities and other organizations in Doña Ana, Luna, Grant, and Otero counties. Well, she also works closely with the ACLU of Texas. Uh, Maria has been instrumental in um, complaints filed with the Office of the Inspector General on behalf of detained migrants and children. And before coming to the ACLU, um, Maria also worked with the Housing Authority in El Paso, Texas, and was an organizer with the Service Employees International Union in El Paso, Texas as well. Um, from the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, we have Vanessa Gonzalez and Shailini Thomas. Vanessa grew up in Taos, New Mexico, and um, her upbringing drove her to fight for equality for Black and Indigenous people of color. Vanessa has represented immigrants before the U.S. Customs and Immigration Service as a Department of Justice accredited representative. She's helped over 300 people naturalize with, in her work with the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. Vanessa is constantly addressing and undoing her internalized white supremacy and evaluating, evaluating what equity looks like. Shailini Thomas is the legal program manager at the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center and is also a Department of Justice accredited representative. Before joining the, AC, or the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, Shailini worked for Diocesan Migrant and Refugee Services in El Paso, Texas. And we also have Serge Martinez um, from the UNM School of Law. Um, Serge teaches primarily in the UNM School of Law's Economic Justice Clinic, which focuses on support for grassroots economic development initiatives 
enforcing the rights of low wage workers and improving housing stability and conditions for low income tenants. He also directs the wage theft project and has co-taught a course on affordable housing at the School of Architecture. His research interests are centered on clinical legal education, housing law, and social change movements. Um, before coming to UNM, Professor Martinez was a clinical professor of law and founding director of the Community and Economic Development Clinic at the Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University. He also founded the first law school clinic in Taiwan as a Fulbright Scholar and visiting professor of law at National Taiwan University College of Law in Taipei. So thank you all so much to our panelists for being here today and agreeing to help us out with this presentation. And if you have questions for the panelists during the presentation, um, please uh, chat them in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that chat and passing questions along to our panelists. Um, and so I am going to turn it over to Zoila and Maria. Hello, thank you for uh, being here with us today. Hi, we are happy to be here and um, I'm going to start with um, a mission statement with the ACLU of New Mexico. Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union of New Mexico is to maintain and advance um, the cause of civil liberties, civil rights and constitutional freedom in the state. Also, our vision is of the state where all citizens enjoy equal rights and freedoms regardless of their race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, where people can express themselves freely through their words and actions, and where personal safety and legal rights for everyone are clearly respected in all circumstances. Um, I'm not going to go through the values, you can see them uh, right there. Uh, but for me, it's very important to talk about immigration rights. I've been a migrant um, many, many years ago with four um, beautiful children, um, all US citizen. I was afraid um, even to go out um, of my house. So for me, it's very, it's very important uh, that um, migrants had the, the right to be here. The fundamental constitutional protections under, you know, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is applied for every person, regardless of the immigrant uh, status. So I can attest to to that um, that we need a process that it will be fair for everyone. Also, we started a long, long time ago, a hundred years ago. Uh, with a couple of, uh, a, a small group of attorneys, you know, that they saw that after the, the first uh, World War, um, they were deporting, like they are doing it as we speak right now, um, veterans that have fought um, in the war, on the war. So in the face of these um, abuses, a, a small group of people decided to start the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, like I said, today we're still doing it. Um, and I think that we need to really open up and, and see what, um, what we can do to help out before coming to, to um, to this um, presentation, uh, Nick, uh, he's a veteran. He sent me an email saying that one of the veterans that was reported to Mexico, uh, thanks to, to connections that we have in the community here in Las Cruces and also in El Paso, um, they, they brought him up uh, to court. And, and the update is that he passed his citizen, citizenship class. Um, so, how we, how we can help, you know, or how you can 
uh, ask for legal uh, help. Uh, types of cases that we accept if, um, if we have the resources, the ACLU prioritized cases related to civil rights issues, including those listed below, freedom of speech, press, religion, right to privacy, equal protection, discrimin discrimination, and also due process, okay? We have a form in our webpage uh, that you can, that you can uh, fill out. Uh, it will give you, you know, all the information that we need. We, um, unfortunately, um, due to the, um, a lot of uh, legal complaints that we receive, um, is uh, sometimes it's difficult for us to to get back to you soon. So if your matter is really urgent, please seek the private uh, advice from a private um, attorney or counsel. Um, and right there is the information for you to submit the the information, the legal um, the legal form. And um, so I will pass the next slide for um, our amazing attorney, Soila. Thank you, Maria. Um, a lot of our work intersects across um, different areas of law. Uh, we have um, some cases that intersect with juvenile justice. You know, when a lot of times you don't think that uh, it's specifically an immigrant um, rights issue, but the person happens to have somebody who is undocumented in their family and they're afraid to bring a claim forward because they don't want to get in trouble, they don't want ice called on them or whatever it might be. Um, we also do a lot of work around um, religious liberty and how that intersects um, with um, women's rights or reproductive justice. There's no um, one size fits all approach to the work that the ACLU does. We really just try to uphold the constitution on various intersecting um, areas of the law. Specifically, some of the work that we're doing now, um, we've had several cases where um, we're seeking um, currently an emergency petition asking the Supreme Court to reduce the prison and jail population because of COVID-19. Um, over the last uh, six months, we've really tried to um, pivot some of our capacity and focus to try to uh, provide uh, services that are responsive to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're also, um, uh, because we're not a, um, direct services organization. Uh, we try to be strategic about the cases that we are able to take. And so when we are able to take such cases like a habeas case uh, to get somebody who's medically vulnerable released from a jail where um, they don't have readily accessible access to hand soap or um, social distancing uh, or even clean uh, face masks, you know, it's, it's something that we try to go across. We've done uh, cases for transgender discrimination, for employment, cases within um, APS where a teacher was blatantly disrespectful and discriminatory to a, a Native American student. We've taken on cases um, over the last year of uh, mansplaining, you know, where um, a person uh, was uh, uh, three women uh, district attorneys were discriminated against for um, uh, being outspoken women and, say, and having signs on their door that said, no mansplaining allowed in this room. Uh, we also do a lot of discrimination cases and excessive force cases, whether it's a, a business um, or you know, a state agency such as law enforcement um, violating individuals' rights. Specifically, my project um, is around immigrant rights issues, and so we do a lot of investiga investigative intakes, whether that's um, excessive force, unlawful um, search, uh, information sharing between MVD, parole and, and probation, and ICE, or um, human rights detentions in, um, 
and immigration detention centers or in federal custody within the prisons and jails in our state. Um, any uh, type of uh, work that touches immigration on advocacy, deprivation of liberty, civil, li um, civil rights violations, or even just the presence of ICE in our courts is something that I work on um, dedicated uh, to these specific issues. So if there's anything that you um, have a sense that intersects with um, immigrant rights that has touched on uh, civil rights or your family or your community um, or members of your organization, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, one of the key things that we do is know your rights presentations because it's a key thing that we can do to build capacity within our community and our states um, because communication education, um, community education is a key strategy that we use in our advocacy work. Um, thank you, Soila. And uh, just uh, before I start, uh, no matter who is the president, everyone living in the U.S. has the uh, the same rights, the basic rights under the U.S. Constitution, undocumented migrants uh, have this right too. It's important that we all um, protect those rights. Um, if you find um, to have um, to deal with immigration and custom enforcement, uh, they need to know their rights. And one of the things that I always, um, when I do the presentations, I always say, you know, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. You have the right to uh, proper translation. You have the right to an interpreter. Uh, don't sign anything that without your attorney present. But also they need to know that they need to have a plan, okay? A safety plan beforehand. Why? Because even if even if you have a status, if you go out, you don't know what you are going to be encounter. So memorize the phone number of a friend, family member, um, an attorney. If you take care of children or people, um, please talk to somebody that in your absence, somebody will be taking care of those children or adults. Keep important documents in a safe place, but tell somebody, okay, that you have already spoken to, where those documents are, okay? Uh, make sure your loved ones know where to find you um, um, and how to find you. They can go into the detained uh, locator um, uh, if necessary, or also call the ICE office that usually they don't answer, but keep calling and keep calling. Um, so those are the important things for them to know. Um, another thing is that um, whenever I told them, whenever you are detained and you are in your vehicle or at your house or just um, walking, always, always have your hands on the, um, for the officer to see your hands, okay? If you are going to move in any way, one of your hands or both of your hands, you need to tell the officer, I'm going to look for my cell phone or I'm going to look for my identification before you do any, any movement, okay? Um, also, we have an application, Mobile Justice. New Mexico is free. Um, you have in front of you how to download. Um, remember that you have the right to videotape. Um, any situations uh, that you are threatened or you see somebody in danger, uh, please follow up the instructions. It's really easy to download. Uh, get involved. We always looking for leaders and volunteers and advocates. Um, and real change start with you. So uh, just follow, um, go to our webpage. Um, also, we are having an advocacy training um, for October the 8th uh, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. We are going to be discussing our priorities for our next, uh, our next um, session. And there is our contact information. Thank you so much. Any questions, you. you can share them to us. Get involved. Uh, we could uh, use all the help we can get. And there's so much knowledge that we want to share. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Soila and Maria. If anyone has um, questions now, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box. 
And um, if you think of questions later, you can ask them later, obviously. And um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa and Shailini from the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right, can everyone see my presentation on the big screen? I'm going to take that as a resounding yes. 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 Great, thanks. All right, um, so yeah, I'm Shalini Thomas. I'm from New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. Um, and what uh, Vanessa and I wanted to talk about today was a little bit about, uh, about what, who we are, um, about the types of cases that we accept with a little bit of background about what each of those types of cases are, um, and then how uh, you and the folks you are working with can contact us with immigration questions or if you need uh, help with an immigration case. Hi everyone, so I'm just going to give a little synopsis of who we are. So our organization was founded in 2010 in Albuquerque um, by our deputy director, Jennifer Lando. Um, and she saw a need in Albuquerque uh, at the time where there wasn't really much uh, immigration serving organizations here in Albuquerque. And so with this goal, she created NMLC. Um, we have since grown into a much larger organization uh, with over, I believe it's 15 attorneys, maybe something like that, Shawnee, you can clarify that for me. <laughs> and there's several legal assistants. Um, we are a social justice organization committed to working with rather than for immigrants in New Mexico. And this is something that's very important to us, um, this language specifically of saying working with, because our mission is, is about advancing justice and equity by empowering low income immigrant communities. And for many of us who work at New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, we've either received services from a, a legal organization or some of our family members have. And so we've seen that it can be very difficult to navigate these systems. And so we prioritize making sure that folks understand the process that they're going with, they're going through, um, and hence why we say we work with individuals rather than for. Um, the ways that we advance justice and equity by empowering low-income immigrants is through our collaborative legal services. So, of course, part of this presentation is making sure that we're collaborating with organizations that provide different types of services for the people that, um, that we are serving. And then doing advocacy, we have participated in legislative sessions to make sure that there is systemic change uh, in our city and in our state uh, that benefits and, and drives for equity for um, immigrants. And of course, education, part of this is that we give a lot of Immigration 101 presentations to um, other organizations in Albuquerque and throughout New Mexico. And it is something that we are always open to doing um, in case anyone is interested in that service. Um, in 2019, we served 4,766 people in 26 of 33 counties in New Mexico. And we hope to increase um, our reach to all 33 counties in New Mexico. Yeah, so a little bit of who we are um, and the types of work that we are able to provide. Um, we primarily work with humanitarian forms of relief. And so what this means is that it is um, for victims of crime, and trafficking uh, for special immigrant juvenile status, um, asylum and detention, citizenship, DACA applications and renewals, immigration court for people who are non-detained and immigration bond cases. And although I went through this pretty quickly, please know that um, Shalini and I will be covering what these uh, forms of relief are. Um, we'll give a brief description of each one. Um, and generally, we do not do family-based petitions and consular processing, and we'll also cover a little bit about what these processes look like. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so our presentation today is really focused on the collaborative legal services aspect, um, and we provide those services in three main ways. One is direct representation, which is representing people before USCIS, before uh, EOIR, before immigration judges, before ICE. 
Um, we also do a lot of pro se workshops, um, and that is where we screen people for eligibility. Um, we make sure there's no risk to uh, them filing for what they're filing for, and we help them fill out their forms, but they submit the forms on their own, um, and we are, do not take on their case for representation. Um, and we also do uh, Know Your Rights or legal orientation programs in detention centers. We have uh, very robust programs in both Cibola and Torrance um, for those who are being held by ICE. Um, and uh, the way that folks can connect to us for the legal orientation program is that they would call into our office during specific times, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, so that they can speak with uh, attorneys and with uh, legal representatives who can help orient them on their case. Um, and given COVID, uh, everything is now remote, including our pro se workshops, um, which has its disadvantages, but does mean that we are, uh, it is easier now for us to help those in more remote areas, uh, which is a trade-off and has its, has its advantages. Um, so we have a very short, very quick presentation about uh, basic forms of relief or ways people can get papers or can get status. Um, immigration law is very, very complicated. Uh, we're going to go over the bare minimum eligibility requirements for a lot of programs. The point of this presentation is not that you're going to remember everything that I say. I honestly expect you to remember about 3% of what I say. Um, the point is that you remember maybe that some of these programs exist, that relief exists for people who have family members who are citizens or residents, or relief exists for people who have been victims of crimes or people who have been victims of domestic violence. Um, and you encourage people to reach out to us so that we can better orient them and educate them um, because, like I said, this is very complicated. Um, and so it's, it's better to reach out to experts always. Um, so uh, family-based relatives is probably, or family-based petitions is probably the most well-known part of immigration. Um, if you have a family member who is a citizen or a resident, that can sometimes help you become a resident yourself, get your green card. Um, we're not going to go into who can petition um, or who is eligible because those rules are complicated. As Vanessa mentioned, we as an organization do not normally accept family petition cases. However, um, she will talk about our Friday phone hours, which is the best way to talk to a legal representative at our organization. Um, and we are happy to answer questions about family petition and give general guidance about family petitions during those phone hours. Uh, another way someone can get status is through the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA. Um, it is for survivors of domestic violence, uh, where the abuser is their parent, spouse, or child, and where the abuser was a, is or was a citizen or a resident. Um, it is similar to the family petition status, uh, family petition process, and that you need a family member who is a citizen or a resident but it allows the survivor to get status, to get papers without needing the cooperation of that abusive family member. Although it is called the Violence Against Women Act, it is definitely not just for women. Um, in many cases, the survivor of domestic violence can include their children as uh, derivative family members, even if the child has not been, a, is, has not been subjected to domestic violence. Um, the family-based immigration process is, has a lot of rules, has a lot of requirements, has a lot of obstacles. Uh, getting papers through VAWA allows you to get around some of those obstacles. So it is in some ways more lenient than the family petition process. Um, and depending on the facts of the case, it, it may allow the survivor to become a full resident. Um, sometimes it, it may happen that the survivor is not eligible for residency, but is eligible for a work permit um, and is eligible for status and to be able to stay here and to be able to work legally. Another way someone can get papers is get some get residency is through a U visa. Um, U visa is for survivors of certain types of crimes. Um, so VAWA is just for domestic violence. 
U visa is for many other types of violent crimes, assault, domestic violence, rape, kidnapping, murder, or an attempt to do any of those crimes. The list is much longer. Um, so basically violent crimes. Um, with VAWA, you never have to have called the police, but it does have to be domestic violence. With U visa, it is open to survivors of many other types of crimes, but you do have to have called the police. There does need to be a law enforcement report and the survivor needs to have cooperated with law enforcement. Um, and there's a process through which uh, we ask for uh, law enforcement to certify that the survivor was in fact helpful in, this, in the investigation process. Um, in many cases, you can include spouses, uh, children, depending on your age, you can maybe include parents and siblings in that application, even if they were never uh, victims of a crime. Um, there is a very long wait list for U visa. So right now with the backlog between the time that you apply or right now, immigration is working on cases that were filed in 2015. Um, so it looks like it's about five to six to seven years between when you apply and when you actually get a work permit. Um, and then there's a little bit more time before you get U status or U visa. And once you've had U status for three years, you can apply for residency for your green card. Something similar is T visa. T visa is specifically for survivors of human trafficking. And we'll talk about uh, the definitions of trafficking that, that immigration uses. Um, a, for U visa, you can also apply for a U visa if you are a survivor of human trafficking. Um, sometimes T visa is a better option for survivors because you don't necessarily need that certification from law enforcement that you were helpful in the investigation. Like U visa, you can include family members in the application. Like U visa, you can apply for residency uh, after having the T visa uh, for three years. Um, a, another huge difference between T visa and U visa is that the T visa backlog is nowhere near as long. Um, so you're not looking at five years between when you apply and when you get your work permit, which is Right. Um, so going into the main types of trafficking that we work with are labor trafficking. Um, when someone is forced to work for no pay or forced uh, to work to pay off debts, um, it does require physical force, fraud, or coercion. Um, sex trafficking is when someone is induced into sex acts by a trafficking. Uh, again, through force, fraud, or coercion. Um, and as we screen for trafficking and to see if someone is a survivor of trafficking, um, we don't ask, are you a survivor of trafficking? Because most, many survivors will say no. Um, and so we ask things like, have you ever been in a situation where you felt forced to work or obligated to work or felt like you couldn't leave your work? Um, have you ever been in a situation where you felt forced to have sex? Um, while sex trafficking is normally thought of uh, related to pimps, um, we definitely have cases where someone was tra sex trafficking, sex trafficked by their partner or by their spouse or by their parent. Um, and I just say this again, not because I think that after hearing about this for 30 seconds, you're going to be an expert in trafficking. But rather, if you hear these types of stories, reach out to us, let us know, let us screen, um, because we have experienced screening for these types of things. We have experience working with survivors who are heavily traumatized. Um, so when in doubt, reach out to us. Um, special immigrant juvenile status is another way someone can get residency, someone can get status. It is available for children uh, who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of their parents. The really great thing about SIJS, Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, is it does not matter where that abandonment, neglect, or abuse occurred. That could have occurred in someone's home country. Um, the really, really difficult thing about SIJS is 
Um, it requires obtaining a family court order in the United States. And almost always you have to have obtained that order when someone was under 18 years old. Um, and so we are doing a lot of efforts to try and screen, to try and reach out, uh, to make sure we are uh, talking with and screening all children for SIJS before they turn 18, because once they turn 18, it may be impossible. Um, and so if, if you are talking to a family, talking to a child where a parent, nobody knows where that parent is, somebody knows where the parent is, but they're not sending any money. Um, for whatever reason, a child is not living with both parents that is worth reaching out for a screening because the argument around what qualifies as abandonment, neglect, or abuse uh, can be very lenient depending on the facts of the case, again, as long as that child is under 18. Um, even if a child has just turned 18, if they're under 19, it's still worth reaching out. Um, if a child is under 21, but there is some sort of custody or family court order that exists, worth reaching out. Um, always better to ask questions. Uh, another way to get status is asylum. Asylum is for those who are fleeing persecution, who are scared to return to their home country. Uh, winning asylum in this geographic area under the court circuit that we are in is extremely difficult. Um, but again, always reach out so that we can screen. Um, you do have to prove, the, the asylum seeker does have to prove quite a number of things that uh, why they are being persecuted, who is persecuting them, um, that their government cannot or is unwilling to help them. Um, but again, m probably the most complicated uh, way to get status that, that we work with. Um, always worth reaching out for a screening, especially with recent arrivals. Um, Usually in order to mean qualify for asylum, you have to have entered the country less than a year ago. Uh, there are certain exceptions. So again, keeps it, uh, reaching out for screening for assistance. Um, but especially if you're talking with recent arrivals, people who have entered in the last few months, in the last year, please have them reach out so that we can uh, screen their case and see if they're eligible for asylum, see if it's in their best interest to apply for asylum. Thank you, Shalani. Um, so Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, often referred to as DACA, um, is an immigration benefit that people can also apply for. Um, right now, unfortunately, they are only accepting renewals. Um, and people may have heard of DACA. There's a lot of attention in the media around it. Um, and so some of the things that people need to be able to qualify for their renewal is that they enter the United States before their 16th birthday, continually present in the United States since July 15, 2007, and they are a high school graduate or received GED in school or GED program or completed military service. Um, and this is an educational requirement that can also be met by, for example, if they're taking a class at a nonprofit organization. And so we will assess all of these things when people call us for uh, renewals. And unfortunately, if someone has uh, certain criminal issues, they may not be able to apply. Um, or if they could be considered a threat to national security. But this is something that we will assess and let the individual know, you know, it does put you at risk if you renew your DACA at this moment. So um, DACA, as Shalini will mention in a little bit, is not a path to citizenship. It is, um, you will receive what is called deferred action. So individuals are more safe from being uh, deported or uh, from ICE going after them and then Another thing that someone can receive or will receive is a work permit. Um, and right now it is for two years. Um, past October 2nd, we are waiting to see if the work permit will be reduced to one year due to uh, a new policy by US uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, and so we will screen folks for their renewals. And at the same time, while screening for renewals, we will screen to see if they can apply for some other type of benefit that does actually lead to residency and citizenship. Um, so even if some, you know, someone who, you know, hasn't had DACA in the past, um, but they may 
you know, they may meet all of these things and they can't apply for an initial, we are still able to screen them for all those other types of immigration reliefs that Shalani mentioned. So I would say, you know, if you meet anyone who's in that age range, just feel free to send um, us their contact information or feel free to refer us uh, to them. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so this is just a, a summary page um, talking about the basic requirements of each of the programs that we talked about, talking about how long it takes for someone to get a work permit and then for someone to get residency. Um, so I won't go over this. Um, hopefully we can share the presentation and then you'll have this for the future. Um, but just to recap, we talked about VAWA, U visa, T visa, DACA, and SIJS. Um, yeah, and now we're going to go into naturalization or um, what people refer to as applying for citizenship as well. Um, so some of the requirements for this is that someone has to be a lawful permanent resident for five years or three years while married and living with a US citizen. Um, and they must be able to speak, read and write in English and pass a civics exam unless a waiver is available. Um, and this waiver is something that is available for folks, for example, who have Alzheimer's um, and it affects their memory and being able to uh, retain this information or for someone who has um, depression or anxiety. We have been successful in several waivers and this is something that we will assess with the individual. Um, individuals who have been outside of the US for more than six months or who have criminal convictions could be in jeopardy of losing their permanent residency if they apply for citizenship. So we, when we are um, seeing if someone is eligible for citizenship and during the screening process, we really go over different things that could put them at risk. And we are very honest and upfront with folks and ask for them to be very honest and upfront with us because um, it could be that maybe they don't share something with us, but USCIS, US Citizenship and Immigration Services may already have that information. So we ask folks to be completely honest throughout any of these process that they go through with us. Um, and we try to build that repertoire with folks so that they understand that, you know, sharing this information with us doesn't put them at risk um, whatsoever. Um, acquired and derived or inherited citizenship. So this is a complicated, very complicated process that I am just going to cover very briefly. Um, so for someone to be able to acquire derived citizenship, they must have a biological parent who has been a US citizen um, when they were born, or they must have been a US citizen before they turn 18 and must have been an LPR before they turn 18. Um, and then also they can qualify for it if their biological grandparents must have were a US citizen and um, when their parents, I got confused, when parents were born, <laughs> or grandparents must have been a US citizens before their parent turned 18 and the parent must have been an LPR before they turned 18. So this is super complicated, even while I'm reading it, it's like, I couldn't really comprehend it that well. But this is something that again, we will screen for folks um, and that's the important thing to know. And Melva, I think the slides will be available. Um, but again, so this is something that we will screen folks for, um, see if they could acquire and derive citizenship and they don't actually have to go through this whole process of the citizenship where they have to do an interview or the exam. Um, and we'll be able to make that assessment because we do look at a lot of different things for every case and we know that every case is an individual case. Um, so again, you don't need to memorize if they could acquire a derived citizenship. This is, these are details that we will look at. Um, and examine for each case. Okay, um, who can we, who, who can help um, in these types of cases? Um, and we emphasize this because we know that there are a lot of well-meaning people um, in the community who want to help folks, um, but we do not want people to be at risk, um, especially under this administration. There has been um, more enforcement towards immigrants. Uh, so, the individuals um, who can help are licensed attorneys, preferably people who primarily practice in immigration law. We have seen an uptick in um, licensed attorneys who don't practice immigration law wanting to help. And while we appreciate it, we, we know that there are a lot of risks involved. And so um, if you know of any licensed attorneys who want to be doing this work, they, you can refer them to us and we'd be happy to work with them. 
um, accredited representatives who work for an organization accredited, accredited by the Board of Immigration Appeals, such as NMLC or Catholic Charities. Shalini and I are both accredited representatives. Um, and what this is, is that we uh, were able to show that we received enough training and knowledge of immigration law to become a representatives and to be able to represent folks before USCIS. Um, notary publics or notarios cannot lawfully provide immigration legal assistance. And this is something that folks sometimes um, don't understand when they're here in the United States because many times um, in uh, Latin American countries, notarios are, is the same word that is used for attorneys. Um, and so we tried to emphasize that notarios here are not attorneys um, and cannot provide these types of services. Um, and the reason that we emphasize this is because, you know, even someone with the best intentions can cause someone to be placed in deportation proceedings if they file an application that states something, you know, that there was some type of criminal record or they forget to include um, some type of immigration violation, then that could put someone at risk. Um, and it's sometimes it's, it's a lot of small details that could put someone at risk, um, which needs assessment by someone who knows immigration law and knows um, the information that uh, could put someone at risk. Yeah, so how to access our services. Um, we host phone hours is what we call them every Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And I've outlined the steps for people to be able to call our phone hours. Um, the first step is that an individual seeking services should call our main line, which is 505-247-1023. Um, and from there, they will be during that 11 to 1 uh, uh, time slot, they will speak to a legal representative, which is um, an immigration attorney or a uh, DOJ accredited representative like Shalini and I, will speak to them briefly about their case. Um, if the legal representative finds that they may qualify for a service that we provide, the case is brought to our larger legal team uh, to staff for an in-depth consult. And so while we don't provide an in-depth consult when they first call, um, we will we, we try to do it within two weeks of receiving that initial call with an attorney or a DOJ accredited representative um, so that we are able to let someone know if we um, are able to take their case or if we see that they qualify for something, but maybe we can't take their case because it's not a type of case that we take. Um, and, you know, even if we are not able to take someone's case because it's a service that we don't provide, um, like Shalini mentioned, you know, they can still call during our phone hours and we can still give them some brief information and give them referrals to trusted private uh, attorneys that we know in throughout New Mexico. And these are all people who we've worked with in the past. Um, the other service that we are currently providing is for citizenship, citizenship green card or residency renewals and DACA renewals. And again, we ask folks to call our main line um, at 505-247-1023 um, and mention that this is the type of service that they need. Um, we do have an ongoing list of folks and we call them for an eligibility intake. They will schedule the appointment with them when they first call and then someone will call them to do the intake. Um, if found to be eligible and we know we don't assess any risks with them going forward, we assist them in filing uh, in filling out the forms and we will send them the completed forms with instructions on how to mail out. Like Shalini had mentioned, this is a pro se service, so we don't directly represent these individuals. The only exception that we have for representing individuals in citizenship is if they qualify for um, a waiver to not take the exam. So for example, as I mentioned, if someone has dementia, Alzheimer's, and they need that extra, um, extra assistance throughout the process, then we will um, directly represent them. However, most uh, applicants are not people who we will represent directly. Thank you um, so much, Vanessa and Shalani. We also have a question while people are waiting for their work permit, do they get a letter or some kind of document saying they are waiting for their work permit? And can this letter prevent them from getting deported? Um, so once someone has applied, submitted an application to immigration, they get a, a receipt notice, which is just a notice that their application has been received by immigration. Um, can this document prevent them from getting deported? It should. Um, 
And under previous administrations, we were more likely to confidently say, yes, it's more likely. Um, under this administration, it really depends, especially something like uh, if you are arrested and ICE comes to talk to you, if you're at a checkpoint, that receipt notice is not sufficient to prevent someone from getting picked up by immigration. Um, depending on what the underlying facts of the case are and what kind of uh, why they are originally eligible for a work permit, if they're applying for a VAWA or U visa or T visa versus um, maybe a family based petition. Um, depending on what the underlying form of relief is, makes it more or less likely whether that receipt notice is actually going to help them. Um, it would require, if all someone has is a, street, is a receipt notice, it likely requires uh, pretty profound advocacy on the part of a community organization or on the part of their legal representative to try and convince ICE that yes, they should exercise discretion and not pick someone up. Um, so that's not the most concise answer, but hopefully it's a little helpful. Thanks. Um, any other questions um, for Vanessa and Chalani before we move on to Professor Serge Martinez? And again, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end as well. Um, so if you think of questions along the way, um, definitely go ahead and put them in the chat box. And now I'll turn it over to Professor Martinez. Thank you so much for being here with us also. Absolutely, and I'm delighted to talk about, um, about what we do at the law school. Wait, can you all hear me? I'm not showing up on my screen. Okay, sorry. Uh, to talk about what we do at the law school, um, it will be significantly less uh, comprehensive and detailed than what um, the others have done. Um, so I don't know if that's good or bad from your perspective, but um, I'll be brief. Uh, I want to just tell you about what we do at the law clinic. The law clinic is Actually, we are just celebrating our 50th birthday at the law school, at the clinic. For the last 50 years, we have, mm, uh, every student who's been in the law school has, um, has gone through our clinical program in their final year of law school. And we train them to be ready to go out and be lawyers through our, um, our, law, for, our law, law clinic, which is actually an in-house law firm that um, they work in as lawyers on um, real clients and real cases um, as a way to sort of develop their, their preparation for practice. And we have, <clears throat> excuse me, so we have, you know, 100 students a year rotating in and out of the clinic in three or four month chunks and different professors from around the law school. But one, what, what has kept pretty stable has been our core mission and our core focus and some of the and the core areas that we work in so we want to make sure that we are you know training our law students obviously but the way we do that is through using our firm to be able to serve folks who don't have access to private lawyers in a variety of areas and ideally it will also be something that's not the, the you know not a bunch of other people are doing uh, around the state so we can fill unmet needs the currently we have five sections to our clinic we're one big law firm but we have five different sections that that work in different areas we have the one that i primarily work in is called our economic justice clinic and in the ejc we work with tenants who are facing issues with their housing uh, whether that means they're facing eviction or they have conditions issues or they have left and are trying to get their security deposit back uh, or some other variations on that theme. Uh, we work with people who have performed work and not been paid the way they were supposed to be paid, whether that's not paid at all, not paid minimum wage, not paid overtime, misclassified in some way that is detrimental to their, um, you know, causes them to be paid less than they should be. And we also provide some uh, support for entrepreneurs, uh, especially, you know, folks from low income communities who might need some legal support for their entrepreneurial efforts. Um, and that takes the form of direct representation or workshops and education, among other things. 
Um, and in the EJC, just like any of our clinics, right, we don't charge for our, for the work that we do. Um, the, I do always say that it's not that, doesn't mean it's free, right? The, the price you pay is that the work is done by law students who are learning how to be lawyers. Uh, and that means sometimes, you know, we are limited in the total number of cases we take because we want this to be a learning experience. And in, you know, and sometimes there are um, built-in inefficiencies uh, with that approach. But we, we stress that we you know, do high quality work in all these, in everything we do. And we also are, we, we limit our work to folks who can't afford private attorneys, but that's really the only limitation we have. We're, we don't make distinctions based on immigration status or you know, or um, any other uh, characteristics other than if we think that someone can maybe go afford another lawyer, then we are unlikely to take them on as a client. In our natural resources section, we work with folks who are engaged in more large, more broadly policy-based issues uh, around uh, energy and natural resource usage in New Mexico and how that affects low-income communities around the state. We have a section, our Southwest Indian Law Clinic, which is for the last 26 years now, has been working to represent individuals from tribal communities around the state of New Mexico. And the Silk works on all manner of, of uh, legal issues, uh, criminal, uh, non-criminal issues, and uh, other sorts of transactional type matters. Um, we have a clinic section called the Child and Family Justice Clinic that works on matters of children, family. Uh, they do work around name changes, they'll work around um, in kinship, guardianships, uh, family law issues that affect everybody. And we also have a section called the Community Lawyering Clinic, which is, is one that does it's hard to define, it's, it's pretty wide open, but they will do a lot of family law, some criminal law, uh, they'll work on, you know, I've, I know they've worked on divorces and custody issues and um, juvenile criminal cases um, and all sorts of uh, hard to define areas of law. Um, and in all of our cases, we do not, as you may have known, and did not mention we have an immigration law Clinic. We don't have any one particular section that focuses on that. In all of our cases, we're obviously attuned to and aware of the role that immigration status and immigration law can play in folks, um, in the actual way the law affects them and in their willingness and ability to, to you know, pursue different objectives. But we also, when it does come up in some of our cases, we have an immigration consultant who we, you know, who works with our office uh, every semester. And as, as things come up, we have engaged in uh, helping folks apply for, um, for the appropriate immigration status or deal with the appropriate issue, deal with the issues as they come up that are tangential to what they're working on. We, a couple of my colleagues just recently just began a special immigrant juvenile um, project that we have that's going to be doing some of that work. I think they might be working with our friends at the NMILC or ACLU. Um, we're deeply connected with both of them and uh, I like to brag a little bit and take some of the credit that uh, Soila was one of our students and we're very proud that she came out just a couple years ago from our clinical program and is doing amazing work. But um, so, so my point is we do, we do not if someone calls us and says, hey, I have an immigration matter, we're unlikely to say, okay, great, we'll do this. We'll refer you out to some of the excellent folks you've seen. But as these things come up in our cases, we are often able to deal with them. And we have lots and lots of experience working with immigrants uh, in New Mexico and the unique problems faced by different communities. Um, I see there's a couple of questions in the chat that I'll try to answer. Um, I mean, every single, contact with our clinic starts the same way right now. And that's by calling our uh, main clinic line. And that number is 505-277-5265. Um, that's our main number. And right now it's almost certainly you'll get a, um, you'll get a 
of, of you'll have to leave a message and then someone will contact you and try to find out more about what the issue is and is it the kind of thing that we can help with in the moment. Uh, like I said, we are, we don't take a ton of cases because we are a teaching clinic and we do have lots and lots of demand for our services because we don't charge for them and provide and do excellent work. So we you know, are regrettably not able to take on every case that comes our way. And some of them are just not right for our expertise at the, you know, or the expertise of the folks in the clinic. But we partner with folks all over the state and we're you know, well connected and we, so I encourage you to, if you do have a legal issue and a question, feel free to call our office at, again, 277-5265 to see if we're a good fit. And if not, maybe um, help understand what are some other options. Uh, we, <clears throat> excuse me, as I said, we, um, we fill, I think, a need that is sometimes, um, you know, that, that there might be a need because other folks around the state, legal service providers may not be able to take on certain cases because their funding sources, um, you know, restrict their ability to work with folks who are, um, who are not, who are, are, whose status is, you know, immigration status is of a particular type or don't have a status. And so we are not restricted in any, in that way. We're able to work with anybody that we feel is a good fit for our, for our services. We don't have those sorts of uh, our externally imposed limitations on the, the kinds of clients we can work with and the kinds of work we can do. Uh, you know, and some of our some of our peers around the state are more limited than we are, so there are, there are occasions when we are the best fit for something. Um, and that is all I have for you today. I don't have a fancy uh, graphic, unfortunately. But and really, it's just seven numbers you need to remember: two seven seven five two six five. Great, thanks so much, uh, Professor Martinez. And um, I also want to reiterate. Um, to just keep in mind the law school clinic as a resource. Um, like Professor Martinez said, some of the legal service providers in New Mexico are limited um, in terms of their funding. Um, New Mexico Legal Aid, who is the largest provider um, of legal services in New Mexico, particularly around issues like landlord tenant, um, housing, they are restricted by their, um, they're funded federally and they're restricted in terms of being able to help people who are undocumented. And so very often the resources available to people who are undocumented can be limited. So the law school clinic is a good resource for people who don't, who have issues that may are not necessarily immigration issues, but that are civil legal issues. Um, so I just want to, to remind everyone to keep that in mind. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists and for all of the great information that you've provided here today. I want to see if we have any more questions before we wrap up. So um, please feel free to put those in the chat box. Um, the slides will be available. I will email the slides out to all of our attendees as long with the recording of this presentation. So you'll have that to go back and reference. And I also want to um, put out a reminder for our next upcoming webinars. We have two more webinars scheduled. We'll have one on kinship guardianship that will take place on October or September 23rd and one on landlord tenant issues that will take place on October 7th. And I will email some more information about those as the dates get closer. Um, please feel free to contact me to register for those if you haven't already. And um, then um, we will just continue to present these webinars with information um, as people give us ideas about what information is helpful. We really want these to be beneficial to the community. So please let us know if there are other topics that you think are important. Um, and so, um, Zoila, 
asked to go back to their presentation to um, go over some of the brief Know Your Rights. We have a little bit of time left, so we'll go ahead and do that, Zoila and Maria. And also a reminder that the ACLU is having their advocacy training on October 8th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Um, so contact Maria about that and she can get you that information. Zoila, I'm going to turn it back over to you. So um, I, we were under the impression that we had 10 to 15 minutes. So we sort of rushed through um, our presentation um, to just give a brief overview of some of the work that we do. But I'd like to give um, Maria Coronado, if she's comfortable, a few minutes to just go over the Know Your Rights presentation portion. She did talk about safety and making sure that during any encounters that you know, you're know you respectful and you show your hands and that you also take um, preventative measures. Um, if you have clients that um, have uh, other matters that intersect with their immigration status. So uh, for example, I'm a legal permanent resident. I'm not a US citizen. Um, and so um, in this uh, world uh, that we're living in today, it could be a possibility, unlikely, but it could be a possibility that I could get deported. I have a child, and so maybe I wanna come up with a guardianship plan in case um, one day I'm unable to pick up my child from school. Or, um, you know, so that somebody is able and has a legal authority to take our child um, to the doctor, those types of things. Um, and, and anything can sort of um, escalate from a police encounter to, uh, an arrest um, and, and all of those um, interactions have implications for a person's immigration status, regardless of whether they're undocumented um, or, re or, or legal residents. And so um, given um, today's climate, I think it would just be valuable to know um, that as an immigrant, you're still able to assert your rights. Um, and um, these are just some very basic, uh, we can go over them quickly, um, things that, that you can do to sort of assert yourself um, and or uh, you can let your clients know uh, or the communities that you serve that um, their, their uh, civil rights don't go out the window because of their immigration status, that they still have uh, rights that they can assert um, respectfully uh, in any police encounter. Uh, let me go ahead and... Uh, Make sure that I'm sharing this. As you can see, Zoom is not my forte. Are you guys able to see the, the presentation? Not right now, before yes. There we go. Thank you for your patience. And uh, one of the things that uh, we need to stress a lot is, like I said before, and, and Soila was talking right now, is to have a plan. If you are, uh, if your legal status, you are US citizens or uh, have a work permit, anything, okay? We have to have a plan, okay? Um, so um, the presentations that we, go around uh, to organizations and schools and you know anyone that is interested in in, in um, knowing a little bit more contact us um, my, my information is on my webpage I mean ACLU webpage just go under uh, Maria Coronado and, and you will have the, the information also uh, we need to also stress out that our responsibility, if I'm driving a vehicle, is to be always be calm, polite, and keep, again, our hands visible at all times, okay? So, um, what are my rights if somebody stopped me um, in my car? Um, well, you, you have the right to ask, why are you pulling me over? why is the reason that you are pulling me over uh, and the reason must be something in regards to how you are driving or something that you are missing in your vehicle a light or or something or you did something wrong okay why because we and we have a, i have encountered that say you know 
uh, they stop this family and when they ask what happened, you know, why I'm pulling over, why are you pulling me over? The officers say, because I can't and I want. Okay, so and those are the things. things. I'm sorry. And along those, and along those lines, um, uh, asking, pulling you over just for the purposes of asking you for documentation or your immigration status is also not allowed. Yeah. So uh, you have the right to ask, and also you have the right to ask, am I free to go? Or are you detaining me? Am I, I, and I'm exercising my right to remain silent. If, like uh, Soila was uh, telling, you, uh, telling us, that if they ask for documentation in regards to immigration, you can say, you know, I'm exercising my right to remain silent. If you have documentation, um, the only documentation that they can ask you is um, driving license, insurance, and registration. That's it. And you have the right to not consent to a search unless they have a warrant. Go ahead. The same thing when somebody goes to your home, okay? Um, in the Hispanic um, culture, we always open the door without checking who it is. Okay, and we invite whomever is outside. So we need to be, to be cautious. You can refuse to, to consent for them to enter in your house. Okay, uh, don't consent a search. Uh, you and everyone in the house uh, do not have to answer any question to the officer and ask why. Why are you there? The officer, remember, they cannot go into your house without a warrant, okay? and telling you why they want to go inside. And the warrant has to say the, the, the correct name, the correct address and everything in, in regards to you. Because what was going on in Chaparral is that they were going knock on Soila's house, but they were asking for me, but they wanted to go into Soila's house, okay? They knew that something was wrong with Soila. Okay, so we need to really be aware that they, you know, are tricky. Um, again, you have the right to exercise, to remain silent. You have the right to not sign any documentation without your attorney presence. And you have the right to videotape and take photos. Yeah, this is especially important nowadays um, when, and, and I apologize that we don't have a slide, for um, an immigration encounter, but um, we usually do. Uh, so if you'd like us to do a, a specific Know Your Rights presentation with a little bit more detail, uh, we'd be happy to do that. The contact information is on the last page of this um, presentation, which will be shared with the group. But um, an administrative warrant is typically what um, ICE has if they come to your home, and that is not sufficient for them to enter your home. Mm -hmm. And so um, judicial um, warrant is what's necessary. And so these are some of the things that um, we can sort of uh, provide to members of your community in, in knowledge on, on asserting their rights. And especially, we've been seeing an escalation on use of force anytime there's a police, not police, let me correct that, ICE encounter, which a lot of the times they wear stuff that says police or they'll try to pass themselves as police. Um, in those type of things, um, it, it's important that uh, if somebody in the family's, you know, teacher, teenager, or other community uh, members in, in the youngins that, you know, are very comfortable with smartphones, that it's okay to use our um, app or any sort of app, uh, phone, smartphone to record uh, interactions or take information over the officer. Um, because a lot of times like we've been seeing is there's an escalation of force being used by ICE. Um, and uh, it's important to sort of notate that immigration law is civil law, not criminal law. And so um, it, it, there is uh, still a lot of civil rights that need to be respected in that process. Maria, any closing thoughts? Um, and I think that I also go over the presentation, it takes 45 minutes, okay, because I go into detailing, but because of the time that we have. Uh, but also, uh, when they are videotaping, they need to remain silent because everything, it will <laughs> against themselves. So um, invite me over, we can do it online, uh, virtual, uh, or when we are be able to meet, I can go in and, and do it person. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you. Thank you all um, again for presenting, um, sharing this information with us, attending today. And again, um, just a reminder, we'll have two more. Um, we have two more of these scheduled and we will be developing future ones. So we have our kinship guardianship one on September 23rd and landlord tenant on October 7th. Um, email me to register. Um, I will send you all the information so you'll have my contact info. And um, please let me know if there are other topics. Um, please reach out to any of our presenters as well if you want more information, if you are working with people who might need their services or want advocacy training. Um, we want to make sure that all of you know about these resources that we have in our communities here in New Mexico. And again, just thank you very much for attending and um, your work that you do in all of your communities. Right, thank you everyone and